Hey guys, it's me, Al, and I reckoned, um, like, I know I promised I was going to do a reaction to this, but I figured instead I'd give a quick little uh, thoughts on, as I was just way too curious to watch this when it came out, um, to see just what this baby was like, and I'm of course talking about uh, Railspin Split Space by the Blue Snowplow, which is part five of his Howin trilogy, aka the the engine from the monster under the shed and when i reacted to part one i'm not gonna lie i was underwhelmed i was actually really really underwhelmed when i uh, reacted to the first part and like because just these adaptations were everywhere it was very good aesthetically and it had some really really creepy material in it but i wanted to see something more i wanted to see something that stood out something different something that basically transcended um there's just something that was kind of experimental it became something new i'm always looking for something new especially when i do reactions so i just kind of fell out from doing the series uh, as well as the fact i'm just not a big fan of horror to be honest and i'm gonna be honest i'm still glad i didn't react to it but for a very very different reason okay this whole series is nightmarish, okay? It's one of the most terrifying series on the internet. I'd argue scarier uh, than Timothy, or like Alfred, or just, or even so or Soda or Fallout, or just any anything by like Narrow Gauge. Prob I'd argue, yeah, probably the scariest uh, thing that came out, that's come out of the Thomas fandom. And... It does it with relative simplicity, I must say. It's quite a simple story, like, some of the thematic material behind it is not simple in the slightest, I must say, especially especially when it comes to, like, uh, part five. But I am not exaggerating when I say this is... <laughs> I am not exaggerating when I say this is hands down the best thing that's come out of the Thomas F fandom horror-related. And it's strange because there's a lot of horror-related stuff um, on the on uh, regarding regarding the Thomas fandom. So that's a bold statement for me to make. That's a very very bold statement. But part five especially was just mind blown. I'm not going to explain to you the story uh, as spoilers. Uh, this will be a spoiler-free review. Um, so kind of just a kind of quick little thoughts on mostly because it's very kind of. Um, well, I'm going to try and keep it uh, spoiler free, but it's going to be very, very, um, because it's very, very recent, uh, this project. So I want you guys to kind of see it for yourself. But, um, in short, also pre warning, load of jump scares, load of jump scares, which is quite honestly one of my critiques with it, but I'll get to that a bit later. But in terms of what works, really, like I said, it's the simplicity, it's that simple horror. And yet it's kind of, everything feels kind of so connected. Like, it's basically a theory as, to, it it basically transcends, becomes from a simple ghost story to becoming a theory about why the accidents in season five were so freaking extreme. Um, kind of a spoiler, but not really. Like, I, I, it's not like I'm telling you how it ends. And, um, it's, um... I feel like it's going to be one of those uh, series that's going to be parodied a lot. Like, the char the original characters in this are going to be reused um, in other canons. And it's just going to be one of those things where you cannot displace the characters in this from the canon of uh, Railspin. And honest honestly, they do it really well, especially with Part 5. And... I think the justification for the accidents happening is is very very weird i must say it's extremely extremely weird um but it's it's very plausible it's very very plausible how it ties in this doesn't just feel like a kind of horror thing that a horror story which you could basically put in any fandom this feel like something you specifically could only put in thomas is what i'm saying and i'm applying this to the whole series um but yeah, yeah. Honest, honestly, it's 
it is, I think the Enterprising Engine 93 put it the best. Um, when he said, this has kind of set a new standard uh, for videos and trains. Now, granted, I haven't really used trains. I can if I wanted to, but um, it would just take up so much, so much space on my ca on my um, computer. And, um, you know, that kind of thing. But honestly, I, I, this is, it's just so well put together. Like, there's nothing more to it. It's just a very, very well put together story with absolutely some with some of the best cinematography i've seen in any project on the internet okay i am going that bold the cinema cinematography he did this using trains okay does anyone remember what trains looked like in 2006 because i certainly do but um so just go going from that to creating something like this Holy mama. Honestly, I, I am... It, it's, it's, it's amazing just how something like this can be created. If, if the right imagination and the right... Um, like, if you have the right talent uh, on board... Because he got freaking Enterprising on board as one of the staff for this. And there's, like, original music for it as well. There's... Um... Obviously, there's like one voice actor who for um, each of the episodes, and the one the voice actors um, are actually the kind of narrators are actually really do a really good job. Episode five one, can I tell you what they do something really stupid? They do not stupid, but really really irritating. They do the audio so quiet, the audio of the narrator so so quiet that you can't hear what he's saying, and then you have to turn it up. And so the minute you turn it up, you are completely off guard by a jump scare and it just screams in your headphones. And I'm just like, you bastard. That, that's so genius. That is so, so genius. And like I said, the jump scares are my one critique with it. Really, I, I think the building of tension in this is one of the main standouts. But it... It slightly loses it with the jump scares. I'm sorry, but jump scares really, you've got to build up to it. But jump scares is kind of like, it goes from zero to 60 like that. And it's a big, big shock. But then afterwards, I'm kind of like, okay, I've exhausted all the kind of dread and tension uh, from this project. And it's it's com I've completely exhausted it into watching this. So, so the jump scares are kind of underwhelming like just in terms of like the build up towards them just they they're they're basically just oh jump scare just out of nowhere just jump scare just like that and there's no real building of tension building up to them like it's it's just like but one thing i will say the it's actually at its strongest when it's not using jump scares like when it is using that building of tension when it is building and building and building especially coming towards the climax at the end it's everything just builds and builds and builds until it reaches that satisfying resolution so you don't need to rely i think it's like i get like the jump scares were a kind of showcase of cinematography talent it was kind of like showing um that like hey i can edit um jump scares really really creatively and really kind of visually creepy ways um like especially visually like honestly some of the some of the, it's night there's so much nightmare fuel in this uh you won't be able to sleep but um honestly yeah, honestly that's my only real critique with it and i do apologize if you guys were expecting a reaction to it i do apologize but i am glad i didn't because of the jump scares like that's just cruel like i'm not like, I know, obviously, it's funny seeing me terrified and seeing me get, seeing me jump five miles north and that kind of thing. I get it's entertaining for you guys. It's bad for my anxiety, okay? I would not be able, I would basically be holding my ears the entire freaking uh, reaction. So, no thank you. Just no thank you. I was not going to react to this at all. But that's nothing to do with the discredit towards the series. Honestly... Like, not just, like, part five. And because the other episodes are really good. As part one, obviously, was a bit of a slow start. And 
I am sort of sorry that I was exposed to that first, as it was literally just an adaptation of The Monster Under the Shed. But he turned it into something really good. He turned it into one of the most defining series of the fandom. And I do know there is going to be a sequel. I do know there is going to be a second series. Um, you didn't hear that from me. I, I'm not sure if he announced it, but actually, you didn't hear that from me, okay? You didn't hear that from me. If that is a secret, uh, Blues Nova, I do apologise. Um, but... I mean, I mean, to be honest, with the success of this, who wouldn't expect a sequel? Who, w who wouldn't be demanding? Who wouldn't be demanding a sequel? <laughs> this is a magnum opus, truly. And... And, yeah, 9 out of 10, honestly. 9 out of 10 for this project. So, um, excellent cinematography, marvellous um, uh, audio editing and kind of and kind of just a very kind of simple story behind it. It doesn't overcomplicate itself as much uh, while still having kind of, while still having thematic material to kind of get sink your teeth into, because, you know, I love that sort of thing. Um... Honestly, it's a it's a fucking good project. It's a it's an absolute it's a fucking good project. That is, you could, if you want to define that in two words, this will be in the title: a fucking good project. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, very very quick thoughts on. I again apologies if you got uh, for not giving you guys a reaction to it. Um, hopefully, um, but yeah, just loved it. Absolutely loved it, and honestly, I look forward to more stuff from the Blue Snowplow in the future, because very, very talented uh, Thomas YouTuber. One of the best, hands down, of this generation. So, um, thank you guys so much for coming to my TED Talk, <laughs> and I'll see you guys next time.